Chicago Summit so far? Interesting sessions, conversations? Perfect. So uh, my name is Wally Olatahin. I'm a solutions architect. I actually just focus on IoT. That includes AWS IoT, which is our uh, managed service that I'll talk about in this session, and then just IoT in general. So helping customers navigate their journey to the cloud and getting their, their things connected. So this session is going to be getting started with AWS IoT, and we're going to talk about kind of the the mindset and culture, and then we'll actually dive into AWS IoT, the service. How does the service work? How do you start using it? And what are the integrations really look like? So I have to start with the Internet of Things being plural. Um, it kind of has two paradigm shifts. It is singular and, and plural. Uh, plural in the context that we all have this idea that we're going to have 20 billion or 50 billion or 100 billion devices kind of connected, all working in concert with each other. Uh, but there's also the sense that sometimes the Internet of Things is, is a singular entity. It's a programmable logic controller that sits on an assembly line and processes gigabytes or terabytes of data. So there's different kind of spectrums that we measure scale on. And so when we think about the Internet of Things, we have to look at it in two perspectives. I say we have this macro view. What is the ecosystem of everything? Then we have a micro view. What is this individual device doing and how does it work in concert with everything else around it. So let's just give some examples of where that kind of comes into play. So this is uh, an Amazon Robotics uh, hardware. So this is something that kind of goes around different pallets, basically takes an entire tray of things that are being shipped by Amazon, and then moves them to a given location. So you think this application is built as a single robot, right? So it operates as its own unit. It's got to understand if the temperature is too hot, if a, if a wheel is stuck on a wire. It has to be able to kind of navigate itself in isolation. But when it comes to the plural aspect of the Internet of Things, this has to now be in concert with other robots that are on the same floor. It has to understand globally, is it close to Black Friday or Cyber Monday? Maybe there's going to be more orchestration across all of these fulfillment centers. So we have this interesting challenge, again, where from a business perspective, we have a macro view. How do we have all of these individual robots communicate with each other? How do we have them work so that they're all operating efficiently? And then again, that micro view. This individual robot needs to be able to uh, uh, respond efficiently. It needs to understand if it's stuck. If it is stuck, how to turn around. If it's not carrying enough load, how to get more. So we have those two perspectives kind of battling back and forth when we talk about the Internet of Things. Another interesting concept I like to bring up early is that things are, are not really static assets. So, you know, even if we think about an asset being uh, an electrical pole that kind of sits in one given place, there are still things around it that change over time, whether that's information like the weather or what's driving by it. So you think of something like Amazon Fresh. So these aren't, you know, autonomous driving vehicles today but kind of the logistics and telematics space makes a lot of sense when we think about devices not being static, is that they're going to be moving around a lot. They're going to have great connect connectivity certain times of the day. Sometimes they'll be completely offline. Sometimes they can get updates so that they can make more efficient routing. And other times they'll be offline and need to be able to operate with some level of intelligence. So we have this concept that we have a thing being a micro view or a macro view, many things, one thing. And also understanding that things have different uh, behaviors or attributes about them. And the first one being that they're not really static. They're going to be essentially movable or changing over time. They'll be much more dynamic assets. So the next element when we think about not just being static is that the Internet of Things does include people. Um, these can be external customers, if we think about smart home using devices, but even intermediaries that kind of navigate what a device is doing and then what that device might do next. So another example might be Amazon Prime or Prime Now. We have two different customer identities. We have the end consumer. They're the person consuming the product. They've placed an order, and now they want to track it. But in the Internet of Things, we also have this intermediary. There could be a contractor who does the last mile. How do I take this individual package that's been delivered, that I've been monitoring, that lands on a truck, that then gets to a fulfillment center, and now I need to navigate that product to this person's door? So now we're meshing different data sets together. Static assets, moving assets, customer identities for your end user, and then internal kind of administrative or developer identities that then need to be able to orchestrate how interactions happen. 
To give a good, uh, another example of how we do this is, in Europe, we partnered with Audi and DHL to deliver packages to the truck or vehicle of a, of a person. So I could be a contractor who is essentially a last mile. I pick up a package that's being delivered, and then I'm able to deliver it to the end user via their vehicle. So we've added a third dimension. We have the Internet of Things. This is, your, this is your ecosystem as a customer. I can look at it holistically, and I can drill down into an individual device. Then I have my outside users, external users, my customers, or internal users. Then we layer on top of that that now I want my things to interact with other things. So how do I create this interoperability so that my ecosystem plays really, really nice with other people's ecosystem? So this starts to bring in a lot of complexities. And you know, we've talked a lot about more in this, these first few slides, kind of enterprise use cases or telematics use cases or industrial use cases. But these same challenges actually even happen in the home. If you look at the home, uh, a home for an individual is their enterprise. If I want to allow a, a lock to open automatically be, via my phone, I want to have control over that. If I want to do something voice enabled, I want to be able to trigger something in, in, let's say, Alexa, and then have it turn on a light in a different room. So a home is really an enterprise as well. Things will move around. I've got to uh, mesh all of these devices together. And then I've got myself as one consumer, but maybe my wife wants to use something as well. She wants to turn on the lights because we left them on uh, when we were headed to the airport. So all these kind of complexities still exist in these other verticals as well. So we really understand this perspective. Uh, you know, there's several uh, Alexa devices, Echo devices. You go, if you go to the Builders Fair, you'll see a couple really cool, interesting demos with Alexa. We understand that there's essentially people who want to control devices, either micro view or macro view. And then the question is, how do we end up doing all this orchestration? Whether you're in smart home, industrial, telematics, retail, um, public sector, whatever group you're really working in. It also makes some an interesting paradigm shift as well, because we've talked about this large scale interoperability that happens. But a lot of that is to really drive business value. Um, when I meet with customers, there's always an interesting conversation where it says, I've got an incentive, and what I really need to do is I need to do the Internet of Things. I'm like, okay, great. Like, what business case are we solving? And that kind of shifts the perspective, because what you're really doing with IoT is when you can kind of get closer to the edge, you can be more disruptive. You can make more efficient decisions. You can kind of change the model on the fly and say, well, you know, it used to make sense for us to take Route uh, 93 North all the time because we had enough overhead in the vehicles, but we realized based on time of day and weather, we really should be taking the south route instead. So now you can start basically being innovative within these sectors that you might feel like are, are, are really just stagnant or not really moving as quickly as you think they would be. So that's why we do look at the Internet of Things as, as plural, right? So we have that sub view that we'll dive into but as we start adding that complexity, we talk about how can we interact between devices and applications and users and their identities. And from the AWS perspective, when we started thinking about this, we said, well, how do we kind of look at a service that helps people with IoT and help them start to figure out what all these use cases, how they might solve them, how they might kind of create these nice integrations? So we really focused on three pillars for IoT. We have things at one end. So this is really sensing and acting, being close to the edge. We have the cloud aspect. So this is really the platform. How do you enable network connectivity? How do you send a message, receive a message? That all ends up being kind of the front door for interactions. And then intelligence. Once I see a message, what do I do with it? Do I send it to another service? Do I store it for later use so I can run analytics on it? What is that kind of last endpoint once I actually have data and it's tangible? So this is where we introduce AWS IoT. So I'll go into all of the components from, from left to right, and we'll dive into more of them in a little, bit detail, a little bit more detail later. With AWS IoT, it's a fully managed service. It allows you to connect millions of devices and send billions of messages. With AWS IoT, it's basically made up of subservices or features. If you're looking at the bottom left, we have a thing, which is our, our windmill. We basically send messages. Messages happen over MQTT, which is a pub-sub protocol. 
As messages are sent, we have an authentication layer that allows you to have fine-grained permissions on every single device that connects, publishes, subscribes, or receives a message to AWS IoT. All of that is essentially scaled via this device gateway. So think of a very, very large scale broker that scales up and down as you publish messages or add devices to your fleet. In the top right, we have the rules engine. For every single message that's published, the job of the rules engine is to take that message, inspect the payload, and based on a rule that you define, you can then decide to route that message to another location. So a good example will be you have a temperature sensor. The temperature sensor is set to 10 degrees. Every single time the temperature sensor, let's say, goes up to 70 degrees, you can say, I need to trigger a notification to my phone. So through our simple notification service, SNS. The rules engine lets you look at a payload and then take an appropriate action. We also have the device shadow. And the interesting thing with the device shadow is that it's a basically a virtual representation of your device. It gives you a way to have a, uh, a virtual view of it living in a cloud so that you can continue to operate on it via other kind of applications. So that same example of being an SNS to my mobile phone above a certain temperature, through the shadow, I can say, I want to be able to return, turn the refrigerator up or down. And for me to do that, I send another message through the device shadow, and this allows me to keep a consistent state of what my device looks like, even if I'm not able to communicate, it, com communicate with it directly at the, at the given time. So now that we have an overview, we'll start with that individual thing, that one device. And we'll track that device through its life cycle and talk about a little bit more in depth all of the individual features that I just mentioned. So if we start with the device, uh, any kind of hardware, we have to really start with the, the birth of that device. So what normally happens is you know, you're doing something, let's say, offline in a manufacturing line. You're assembling, essentially, chips. Maybe you have a system on chip. Maybe you're connecting Wi-Fi modules. You're doing all of this in an offline fashion. It then kind of goes boxed up into different trucks, and then you distribute them, either in a B2B scenario or a B2C scenario. But then kind of that last question is, well, once I've configured it, how do I get all of those bits at the end, in this case windmills, actually connected to the cloud? How do I connect it to AWS IoT? And for connecting a thing to AWS IoT, there's really three components. The first one is the device registration, device registry. What AWS IoT has is essentially a registry that allows you to search and create attributes on your individual devices. In a registry, you can give your device a name, a thing name. You can then assign searchable attributes that might say here's a serial number for it, the location, maybe the time of manufacturing. But then you can go back and search for that device in AWS IoT and then make different decisions. So is the device reaching end of life and I need to remove it from the system? Because we have to manage the scale, we then have to think about, well, from a security perspective, how do we make sure that every single device only listens to the channel it's supposed to? And for that, we have uh, keys. So with AWS IoT, there's different ways of bringing keys and certificates. But you can imagine that for your device to connect, it needs an X509 certificate and it needs a private key. The private key is owned by the device. It never really leaves the device, so it sits in a tamper-proof module and just kind of sits to be ready to use, but it's owned by that device. It basically gives it an identity. It's like if you had your own, uh, when you go to your website and you log in and you put in your password, the private key becomes a password for the device. And through that private key, we then do things like permissions, which is a, which is a third kind of step for connecting. And through permissions, you can allow or deny different sets of communication for any individual device to AWS IoT. So diving into thing registration a little bit more. So you can register your things to AWS. So that way you can just find it a little bit later. So you can just say, here is a name that I gave it to, to it earlier. It's a light bulb. Um, it's given by the serial number or a VIN number. Then you define searchable attributes. In the registry, you can have three searchable attributes by default, and then if you use what we call thing types, which basically allow you to classify individual devices, you then get another 50 attributes to store and another three attributes to query. A good example of thing types in the windmill example is I might have a version of a windmill. So a type might be that I've released a version in 2017. Any single 2017 type windmill always has these attributes. 
So it gives you a way of classifying your devices so that as you release another generation, you can give it a new type, give it a new set of attributes, then you can track and find those attributes later. Give you an idea of how this looks in the console. If I create a thing, I give it a name. For the thing type, it's just given a wind turbine. So this is a type called wind turbine and has additional attributes. And now I give it what I want to search by. So in this case, we have an attribute key power grid and then a value Amazon wind farm. And then we gave it a location. So this could be an internal location for your own system. So you can then map, let's say the number 47944 to a given uh, geolocation. So maybe that correlates to some place in Ohio for you or in Chicago since you're here today. So just a, a quick aside here, just wanted to call out this uh, Easter egg on the slide. Um, this is actually just kind of a, a, a virtual view of what Amazon's doing from a, a wind farm perspective. So in 2016, 2017, we announced an effort to have renewable energy via wind farms. So we use wind farms in this demo to kind of pay homage to some of the effort there. So the data has definitely changed, but uh, just to give you an idea of how we kind of think about not just devices, but IoT at, at Amazon. So we talk about thing registration. Now we need to give that permissions and a given identity. And that's through certificates and keys. I mentioned before, every single private key, every single device should have its own private key and certificate. The private key is used to authenticate the device. So we go through this handshake to say, are you who you say you are? Along with that, the certificate is basically registered to AWS IoT. So you do register the certificate to the device so we know this is a certificate linked to this thing. And then a private key you keep local. And then through a TLS handshake, we basically say this all looks okay. You can continue to operate like you were going to. Along with that, we have one third uh, certificate. We have a root certificate authority. The root certificate authority, its job is basically to make sure your device always connects to our service and can authenticate our endpoint. So think about it as a two way handshake. You have a device, you've unboxed it, you've put it on the ground and you want to say, hey, AWS IoT, you can trust me. And for that handshake, you give the private key and a certificate. But you also want your device to be able to say, I don't want someone to give me a random endpoint. I want to make sure that's an endpoint that's owned by AWS IoT, the service. So that's where the root certificate authority comes in. Your device uses the root certificate authority to say, by the way, you have a private key as well, and I should be able to match your root certificate to what you have on a server, and if I can't match you, then you must not be AWS IoT. So we're essentially doing mutual authentication on both ends. We're allowing you to basically authenticate yourself as a device and also authenticate and validate the service from the, the endpoint perspective. I mentioned fine-grained permissions. With AWS IoT, it's very similar to our IAM policies, identity and access management. For each individual device, you can create the mechanism to connect publish, subscribe, or receive a message. Once you create a certificate, you attach that policy you create, those permissions, to the certificate itself. So now what you've done is you said, here's what you can or can't do through permissions, and here's the identity that's allowed to do that through certificates. And those all marry together. Just to show an example of what a policy will look like in AWS IoT, we have IoT colon publish, so can you publish a message to the service? Here's a resource, it's a topic and a client ID. And then we have an, a subscribe at the very bottom that says I want to allow subscriptions, can you receive a message, can you subscribe to this topic? And then it contains private topic and a client name. So the client name at the end, these are just variable replacements, they allow us to do kind of dynamic creation or changing of the policy. And I'll talk about in a, just a few more slides what the topic structure looks like, but view these as communication patterns. So we're saying publish on this communication pattern, subscribe on these communication patterns. And if I don't have any permissions, let's say I don't have permissions to subscribe to anyone's topic, this would actually get an authentication error because I'm publishing to something that's not within my AWS IoT policy. So we cover those three steps, um, you know, creating a thing, getting certificates for it, giving it permissions. A nice feature we added in the console is if you want to try this, there is a kind of connect device wizard 
Uh, if you go in the main registry as well, there's a connect the thing. It will actually do all of this on the fly, so you don't have to do each one individually. Just to get up and running, you can say, I want to connect something, give me some certificates, create a policy for me, and create a thing for me in a registry. And you can actually start coding and, and developing away. So it's a nice quick start for customers. And in the end result, if you're in a console, what you'll see is these four different attributes. So we have our device on the far left. We have the policy associated to that device. We have the type for that device, that it's a wind turbine. And at the very end, where you see the handshake at the, at the bottom, that's our certificate. This is how we trust each other, the mutual authentication. Now, in terms of configuring a device to talk to AWS IoT, you have multiple options. So we have AWS IoT device SDKs and, and languages. So that's, we support Java, Python, Node.js, C++. Uh, these libraries just kind of make it a little bit easier to work with AWS IoT from a kind of object perspective. But since we're using MQTT from a protocol, and just an open source uh, kind of standard protocol, you can actually just use any library. So if you're using Paho, for example, in this piece, MQTT, you can then communicate to the AWS IoT service. You don't have to use our SDKs. From a protocol, we support MQTT, and I'll talk about a, little, a little bit more about that in detail in a few slides. Uh, WebSockets as well, so this allows you to have an open connection from AWS IoT down to a device, and just HTTP. So if you just want to make one individual call, publish a message, and then close the connection, you can do that over HTTP. So now for the birth of the thing. We did that example of just starting one, right? That micro view, you can get started in a console, it's very straightforward. But what ends up being a little bit difficult is that I'm manufacturing a lot of these at one time. So if I'm in production, I might be doing 1,000 at a time, maybe 10,000 or 20,000. I can't turn around and make individual API calls over and over again to the service. I'm, I'm adding latency. Let's say for some reason I'm operating in a place that doesn't have good uh, Wi-Fi connectivity. I don't want it to necessarily block the fact that I'm just creating hardware. So what we've done at AWS is that we've released uh, two different services. One is bring your own certificate and the other is just-in-time registration. But at a high level, what we want you to be able to do is we say, how about you just provision your certificates and your identity completely offline? You can have a PKI or HSM in your manufacturing line. They can create certificates and private keys and you can just continue to manufacture and it doesn't have to know about the cloud. But then asynchronously register them to us later. This allows us to kind of decouple those two workflows. Now you can create identities and certificates as quickly as you want in a local environment, and only when that's unboxed do you then say, okay, now I need to register this because it's about to connect. To give an example of a customer using these services in production, um, iRobot's a, a customer of AWS IoT. They use bring your own certificate in this intermediary certificate process where what they do is they register their intermediary certificates, the things that are creating individual device certificates. And then once that's registered and a person unboxes their Roomba, at that point it then says, go register with AWS IoT. We've already given you an identity and it might have been months ago or weeks ago or days ago. The other option for authentication is you can basically make API calls, you can go on a console. Uh, Another asynchronous process we often is with using Lambda. So with just-in-time registration, we don't see the device until it goes and connects. As soon as it connects, we go through this handshake process. Are you, are you who you say you are? And by the way, did the customer sign you with the right set of intermediary certificates? Basically walking down the chain of trust. But what we want to be able to allow you to do is start actually giving that device permissions right away, right? You don't want the device to just kind of be hanging on an, an open connection, waiting for a response. So with just-in-time registration, you're able to invoke your own code using Lambda. And that Lambda function will receive information about the certificate. It'll say, here's a certificate, here's information about the device that connected with it. What do you want to do next? And you as a customer get to control that business logic to then say, I want to check, let's say, a revocation list to make sure that certificate's valid, or maybe I want to take the certificate and put it in my own internal system so I make another API call. 
You can do all of this via Lambda, and that's all code that you get to basically run, provision, and upload into your AWS account. So we've started the process of taking a thing, kind of unboxing it, giving it an identity, permissions, and getting it connected. Now we have it connected, we actually have to send information to it. And so there's a couple ways of doing that in, in AWS, but for AWS IoT, it all goes through our device gateway, our broker. And so the device gateway is an MQTT broker. I mean, if you're familiar with MQTT, or if you're not familiar with it, it's a, it's a pub sub model. You create individual topics. These topics are basically uh, individual channels the device can either publish a message to or subscribe to. When you communicate with the device gateway, you can also communicate over the other mechanisms. So the same channel structure and topic structure works for HTTP or WebSockets. A nice benefit with MQTT is you can also have a long-lived connection. So many times what ends up happening is the device connects once and then it just kind of starts sending data intermittently. So maybe every five minutes or 10 minutes or 15 minutes. Once you've connected to an MQTT broker and connected to AWS IoT and you've authenticated and giving that the device a set of permissions, you can then just start publishing on an intermittent basis without kind of having the connection go down and then have to recreate a new connection and having to recreate a new connection. So it's different than the kind of HTTP model. You make a request, you get a response. Oh, I want to do it again. I take another request, I send it and get a response. It allows you to have a bi-directional communication between AWS IoT and your device. And I mentioned this is secure by default. So you have to connect using X509 certificates. And from a TLS perspective, it's 1.2 um, being kind of minimum bar for TLS. There's other ways of kind of authenticating to the service when I get into human interaction. But imagine for your individual device, when you're creating certificates, it'll all be X509 certificates and then using TLS 1.2. So I mentioned before, from a topic perspective, we have this pub sub model. Topics are created on the fly. You can choose any kind of binary payload that you want to use in, in AWS IoT. Uh, if you want AWS IoT to kind of trigger downstream actions when I get into things like IoT rules, you want to use a JSON payload for that. So the rules engine can inspect JSON payload and then actually even walk down the JSON payload tree and say, I'm looking for an attribute named top level node in the JSON. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to uh, switch screens and go to a demo so you can get an idea of how this pub sub model works. So I'll be switching to the, the demo now as well. I am not the demo, but it'll come up. <laughs> it's on uh, this screen, sorry. And I'll talk about kind of what the demo is going to do. So with AWS IoT, I talk about that pub sub model, kind of being able to publish and subscribe. A lot of the benefits with AWS IoT is that, uh, you know, you have the secure by default mechanism. You also have scalability. So when I talk about being able to register and have millions of devices connected and then send in billions of messages, you also see that that kind of turnaround latency is very low. So you're able to connect, publish, subscribe, and it's a very interactive fashion. You're not kind of waiting seconds and seconds for things to happen next. They really happen interactively. So when this... Uh... When the screen comes up, what I will have people do is actually go to a URL so you can see kind of how quickly this uh, operates. So for, um, the other question was how do you manage certificate revocation? So in the control plane APIs, we do have a set of APIs for revoking certificates. Um, if the certificate has an expiry date in it, that expiry date is valid. So if you actually say this, this certificate is good for 20 or, or let's say 20 years, when that expires, that certificate is, it's not marked as revoked, but you can no longer connect with it. We do check the expiry. Uh, when it comes to certificate like, rotation, um, that's a process where it ends up kind of being driven by the customer. 
what frequency do you want to uh, create new certificates, and then how do you want to do the certificate exchange? Uh, and that's all kind of customer driven. So we give you the APIs to revoke a certificate and we respect things like expiry date, uh, but then you then have to tie that with your business logic. So, right. I'm gonna jump to the demo, but I do have time for questions at the end, so I will definitely get to them. Uh, so what I'm going to do is this is just a, a light bulb moment. Um, if you go to the bit.ly URL uh, via your mobile phone, what you'll do is you're gonna get connected to my account, to my AWS IoT account. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually start the light bulb to start publishing messages on a topic. So it's going to go up, it's a thing in AWS IoT today, it's going to publish that thing a message and it's going to actually turn around and subscribe it down to your phone if you're on it. And just to give you an idea, if you're actually on your phone right now, I've kind of set it to auto. This is basically going through about every second sending a message down. So it's going up, sending a message down. If you're looking at your phone now, this happens about in real time. So this is going all the way to US East, Virginia. It then says, as you're connecting through your mobile phone, I've got a new subscriber that has permissions to listen to this light bulb. And then now start sending messages down to you in real time. So this kind of uh, uh, real life kind of low latency interaction is interesting because as you add more and more devices, you don't have to go in and manually say, okay, now person one in seat two has permission three, four, five, six. You just wanna say, you have permissions to listen to this topic and hey, here's something interesting. So just to get a show of hands, who has it up on their phone so you get a good count? Good, nice, I see light bulbs going. So in terms of like updating, has everyone seen the updates coming through as well? Awesome. So to show you that it's not really magic or anything like that, here is my thing. So I have created a thing in AWS IoT. It exists as an attribute. I've given it a name, it's my virtual light bulb. It doesn't have a type associated with it. And I'll talk about the shadow in a little bit more detail, but all this gets communicated to what we call the shadow and it's getting persisted. So all of this happens in, in really, really fast time. And again, it's going all the way up to US East, turning around and then publishing that to everyone that is uh, listening during the session. So, right. I'm gonna switch back to the presentation as well. I'll keep that running, so if you're interested to continue to subscribe, you will be free to do so. That is not a light bulb. <laughs> Great, so we talked about the pub sub model. Now we'll talk about kind of finding the signals, right? So that was just one open channel. I started publishing, and I'm just gonna send everything downstream. Well, when we talk about the Internet of Things being plural, again, it's those kind of different constraints. Sometimes you just have a lot of devices, right? There's just 100,000 devices, they're all sending information, and I've gotta interact with them very quickly. It's also the case you just have kind of one large kind of beefy, let's say, hardware that's just sending a lot of data to you as well. So we understand that for all these messages, you don't just kind of want just a stream of everything to just do analysis downstream on your own. So what we have is we basically have a rules engine, and the rules engine job is to basically help you do all of the extracting of value and routing of messages. So you have the rules engine, you set up a rule, and it looks at a message as it comes in, and it allows you to filter that message. So you can say, I don't really care about this message, it's not an alert, just continue to move on. Or it allows you to essentially move that to a different topic or move it and send it to a different device. So the rules engine becomes this kind of a real time processing for you that you don't have to run yourself, it's all kind of baked into the AWS IoT broker. What's really powerful about the rules engine is we hear these kind of use cases where it says I wanna try, let's say, running a machine learning model. And I really wanna do that in a really fast way, but if I gotta do that, now I've gotta go talk to the device team so that they can send information on a different topic for me. Then I'll take that information, then I need to have it go through security, and then after security looks at it, then I'll get it into wherever I'm doing my data warehouse. What we found is that the rules engine gives people the ability and customers the ability to kind of disrupt and essentially innovate without kind of uh, putting a line directly into what you're doing today. So when you create a rule, you can have a rule that listens on a given topic, that light bulb topic. 
you can then decide that light bulb topic is really interesting, but it's gonna be really interesting for my data science team. I'll create a brand new rule. It's completely separate. The device doesn't have to make any firmware changes. It continues to operate. The cloud team that's already using that topic can continue to use it. You create a brand new role that then decides to send all that data to, let's say, DynamoDB, our NoSQL solution. So now you have essentially a way to innovate with still having the same end-to-end -end workflow that you have in production today. Now you have a new team that comes on and they want to do security analysis so they can create their own role. Maybe they route that to S3, and then in S3 they do processing there. So the rules engine allows you to do this kind of navigation, essentially filtering, adding more information to a payload, and then sending it to another service. Next service I'll touch on is the AWS IoT device shadow. So we saw this in the demo. This is a virtual representation of your device. So think about the, the uh, device shadow as a way to abstract what the device has from an attribute perspective downstream. When we think about the device shadow, the workflow is that if your device is disconnected for some reason, how do we give you a persistent state for it? So that when it reconnects, it can either sync commands that were sent down to it, or it can reconcile attributes that it previously had. So it goes offline, let's say I drive, I go underneath the tunnel, then I come out the other end and I'm like, oh, was I uh, sent a message to be routed to a different location? Let me go check my device shadow. So it gives you a persistent view for your device living in the cloud. The device workflow is that your uh, end device will publish its current state to the IoT shadow. The shadow then publishes it in a JSON persistent store. This is a store managed by AWS IoT. At any time, an application that has permissions to get a shadow or make a change to the shadow can say, I want to request your current state. If it has permissions, it can also say, now I want to publish a change to your state. So this is a way for me to send a command down. That command first gets synced to that same JSON data store as an intermediary, and if the device is connected, it will immediately get it over an update topic. The device can then just send its current state again, so it says, you've asked me to change the route I'm going to from high priority to low priority, just letting you know that I've done that. And that also then gets persisted in the same JSON data store. And now my mobile application can either go and get the shadow, or it's, if it's listening to the shadow topic, it can just get it immediately through this MQTT structure. So it can get it in real time as opposed to request response. To show you what this payload looks like in a little bit more detail, we have our device. It generally reports its current state. What is the state I'm currently in today? So in this example, it could be lights, the color is red, the engine is on. Then there's a, the shadow aspect from a command perspective. So we have the reported state. At the very top, we have the desired state. The desired state is what do I want you to be in? This is the command I'm trying to send to you. And then you have your outside actors, which is like the mobile application. So the mobile application can ask what is the current state. The reported state says the color is green. The mobile app says, well, I really want your desired state. I really want you to be red. And along with this JSON structure we give you, we actually give you a lot of additional metadata. So if you're looking at the very bottom of this, you'll see something called delta. Delta is what we publish on an individual topic for that device shadow. But delta just lets you know when you're looking in the console or inspecting it as an administrator, uh, what's the difference between what I asked it to do and what it's currently doing? And that's what's in the delta. What is the difference between the two? So we talked in detail about securing the individual device, this, this one thing that lives and gets certificates and then permissions. But I also talked earlier on about this ecosystem of, of user identities, either end customers or kind of internal users that have to operate in the system. So we still have end users that need the same kind of fine-grained permissions and controls over individual devices. And so for securing user access, we use the same SIG v4 authentication model that we use across AWS. So what an end user will do is they will use something like Cognito. So Cognito is an identity service um, where you can get a set of uh, temporary credentials from AWS. You'll use those temporary credentials to sign a request to say, I would like to publish to this topic. Through the same mechanisms as far as least privilege, we have roles and permissions and policies that are attached to that individual user. 
And once they make a request with those SIG before credentials, we check them, are you allowed to do what you're going to do? And if you are, we allow you to either update, let's say, a shadow or publish a message to a topic. To point out a, a few things at the very bottom of this, when I mentioned Cognito Identity Pools, in Cognito Identity, uh, if you're an anonymous user, so in Cognito you can create an anonymous or an authenticated user. If you're an anonymous user, generally the, the only access you should give is just subscribe. Hey, like I'm interested in kind of hearing about a certain topic. If you're an authenticated user, you can actually take that same policy structure you use for certificates and apply them to Cognito Identities. So that same fine-grained permission, what do you connect, publish, um, subscribe, and receive on for an individual user. So what we've done is, in these kind of three pillars of IoT, we've touched on the things, registration, permissions, policies. We talked about the AWS IoT device gateway and a broker and how do you communicate back and forth. And we talked about intelligence, kind of uh, routing through the rules engine. So this is kind of the view of the world today with all the services that we talked about. What we found from a customer perspective is they said, this is great, but you know, I'm actually working underground 20 hours of the day, I don't have connectivity. How can I do some of this in a different context? So for that, we released AWS Greengrass. And so you can think about AWS Greengrass as a software that extends the AWS cloud capabilities to local devices. So it enables devices to collect and analyze data closer to the source of information uh, without necessarily being connected to the cloud. So with Greengrass as a software package, what we did is we said, let's take some of the, the great things we heard about AWS IoT and, and push them down to the edge. So you get an authentication authorization layer, very similar to what we talked about in the AWS IoT service. You're able to run actions via Lambda, so you can hook up a message to trigger a Lambda function. And we also push down device shadows. So you can have a local device shadow store that can operate without being connected to AWS. So we're bringing all this local compute, messaging, data caching, all the way to the edge without actually having to be connected. So to touch a little bit more on the Greengrass components, uh, Greengrass is software, it is bring your own, own hardware, and I'll talk about kind of the hardware specs that are required. Inside the Greengrass components, you have a Greengrass core. Think about this as your edge gateway. It is, it is the machine that is responsible for doing things like routing, understanding which messages to go to which downstream devices. The other component is our IoT device SDK. So the device SDK that I did with Node.js at the very beginning, it's a very similar device SDK for Greengrass. It just says, instead of connecting to the cloud, connect to this hardware that's sitting in my local context. With Greengrass Core, the runtime is responsible for also running your Lambda functions. So when you create a Greengrass Core, you'll say, here are the devices that I communicate with. And for my business logic, it all runs in Lambda. Every time I get a certain message, I want you to run a certain Lambda function. So your Greengrass Core takes care of your Lambda execution. It does your messaging. For your Greengrass Core, you also determine which shadows your downstream devices do you actually want to sync back to the cloud. So all your devices downstream that may not be able to get all the way up to the cloud but can communicate locally, you can determine do I sync this shadow state or do I just keep it local because it's more important for me to have it closer to the edge. Touch on the local Lambda. Um, the nice, interesting model and shift with Greengrass is that your Lambda functions, since they're really event-driven compute, you can now build them in the cloud. So you can build them in AWS. You can run your Lambda functions there. Maybe you train your machine learning model. And now you can take the same Lambda function and then just deploy it down to Greengrass to run in this local context. So now you could train a model, let's say with 10,000 data sets in the cloud, get some labels or attributes you find important, and then say, I actually want to take this model that I've modified and push it down to Greengrass. I don't have to have a developer that knows C++ to do that. My Lambda function runs in Python in the cloud. It'll run in Python down in Greengrass. So now you have this merging of your development ecosystem workflow. You're taking kind of that intelligence that lives and you're operating on in the cloud and getting it closer to the edge. With the device SDKs, there are two different device SDKs with Greengrass. For the Greengrass devices that connect to the Greengrass core, 
The IoT device SDK is going to connect over a local IP or a local DNS. Uh, the Greengrass devices SDK will also do service discovery. So with the device SDK, it's able to say, I don't know where this Greengrass core is located. I don't know its private IP. I'm going to ask AWS Greengrass, the service, where is the IP located? Then you can go and actually do the connection. Other than this change, it is still an MQTT model. We still require certificates and uh, keys. So you don't have to actually go through this whole kind of rewrite process to use the device SDKs. The same ones that you would use to connect to AWS IoT, you use very similar ones when connecting to Greengrass. So some use cases we've seen come about with this is that customers are taking one Greengrass core, kind of that edge gateway, and then having multiple Greengrass devices associated to the core. And now you can do kind of local intelligence. Now going to that Internet of Things being plural again. If I have multiple devices working in concert, I don't want them all necessarily to go back to the cloud to understand what's happening right around them. So via Greengrass, I can now say, how about you just operate with each other through this Greengrass group? Communicate with each other through Greengrass Core, send messages at a very low latency, all operating in the same context. And then every so often, we might send an aggregate of that information up to the cloud, but we don't need to send all of it. Your Greengrass Core actually still communicates with AWS IoT, so each Greengrass Core gets its own device shadow. It uses the device shadow to do things like update its configuration or do things like certificate rotation on the Greengrass Core, but it acts as a virtual representation of the edge in AWS IoT. And because it uses the same MQTT protocol, we still have that long-lived connection, right? It connects once, it can just start sending and receiving messages, and then determining if it needs to be sent to downstream devices. So some of the benefits of AWS Greengrass, since it's running locally, you know, the laws of physics, since we're closer to our end devices, we can respond much, quick, much more quickly. You can't operate offline. So if your edge gateway cannot connect to the cloud, so that example of running your machine learning model, I don't always want to go and turn around to the cloud and ask, is this match or not? You can operate offline and have that model running in your Greengrass core. So everything can still operate without having cloud connectivity. You get a simplified device programming model. So you can now create Lana functions in AWS, take those same Lana functions, iterate on them, test them, and now if you want to do an update, you can push that same Lana function down to your Greengrass core and now have that Lana function running locally. And you reduce the cost of IoT applications. And this is, of course, several factors, right? You have bandwidth factors, you're sending a lot of information, now you can decide which ones you want to send. And even just from a, a kind of device hardware perspective, now not every single device needs a Wi-Fi module and needs a device certificate that connects to the service. Now you can use, let's say, other local protocols. You might end up using Zigbee or Modbus, something that's a little bit low friction in the local context without necessarily having them all the same set of parameters that the core does. So that was a lot of information. Um, if you're looking to get started, if you go to AWS, Amazon.com, you log into your AWS console, things like uh, Greengrass, AWS IoT, this is all available today in your console. Uh, the console's changed just a little bit, but uh, if you look up Internet of Things, uh, you'll see AWS IoT, and within it, you'll also see AWS Greengrass. Another mechanism for really helping customers get started and, and moving quickly is uh, today we announced the AWS Marketplace for IoT software on AWS. Um, you can think about this as a discovery landing page where it, it makes it easier to um, discover kind of complex ecosystems for IoT applications. So many of these partners that are listed here are uh, either integrated with AWS IoT, some cases are not integrated with IOT, AWS IoT, but we have a close IoT overlap and engagement. To touch on one of the partners here, uh, SI, this is an example of a traditional hardware manufacturer and connectivity provider. So they're leveraging the power of AWS and AWS uh, Marketplace to rapidly deploy IoT applications. So what you're able to do through SI is you can basically get a SIM card, you can actually buy it from Amazon.com, and then you can seamlessly take that SIM card and get it connected to AWS IoT the whole thing around re registration, certificate management, giving you permissions, and now you have your SIM connected through AWS IoT through SI. 
So definitely check out the AWS Marketplace. The actual link for that is available at the very bottom. So awsamazon.com slash marketplace slash IoT. We have several other interesting partners as well, such as B-Square and the Vice Authority. So with that, I think we have some time for questions. So I'll definitely take questions and, and thank you all so much and enjoy the rest of the summit. If you have questions, I think there's a mic right over there, or you can come up. If you, if you have, uh, uh, like, remote sensors that were offline most of the time, and you just wanted to do, like, a, a data collection, um, would you need to implement with the green grass in order to do that offline and then upload that to the AWS IoT? Um, you'd have a choice. So if the end devices are able to connect, you can have that sent directly through AWS IoT. And let's say they the would, sensors they'd don't. Be, they'd be remote. Like, let's say they were weather sensors, mm -hmm. and so they don't have even cell, cell signal in the area. And so we would go around manually, like with trucks. Or OK, I see. You would have to do, so the uh, Greengrass only communicates over MQTT. Um, you can still have the Greengrass core, uh, you can still have the code running on Greengrass do things like protocol conversions. So your weather sensors would still have to have some consistent protocol to speak to the hardware that runs Greengrass core. But more of a simple, um, just a data like a exchange. Daemon. Yeah. 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 It would be a daemon that would run locally, do the aggregation of the downstream weather sensors. Then when it's ready to actually publish that to AWS IoT, it would then publish one aggregate message to the Greengrass core, who then sends it to AWS IoT. And it would have all the different sensor identifications with their, with their information. For information like that, you'd either have to include it in the topic payload or in the, the, the topic itself. So mm -hmm. like when you create the topic structure, you would need to say, this data links to this device ID. So like sensor A may have 30 days of data before the next time it gets collected. So it'd have a whole payload itself and then sensor B is gonna have its own payload and those are all. They yeah, you, you'd probably end up like putting your payload more in kind of size limits versus date limits because like you'd only wanna send so much in one message. Uh -huh. um, but it would still kind of look like that structure. Your device would have its own, your sensor would have its own topic and then you would have your daemon say for this topic, here's the data I want you to send in one message, and then work through, let's say, the last 30 days or 10 right. days or one day. Yeah, okay, thank you. Yeah. You're welcome. You mentioned that uh, the Greengrass core uh, communicates with Azure devices using the internet protocol with MQTT. Is there any intent to use or help implement uh, protocols for lower bandwidth connections, like, say, Bluetooth or Zigbee or other things like that? Or do you have to just roll out that connection yourself and then you know, have like, uh, the green core gateway uh, communicate to the cloud using MQTT yeah, so instead? For today, what, what happens is that that example I mentioned earlier is you do have to have a daemon that does the protocol conversion for you. Um, I think what we look for is like customer feedback on what protocols that we should support um, and what other kind of networking layer we need to support. So not just TCP, but maybe others. Um, so right now, it's mostly gathering customer requirements, hearing, hearing what uh, we hear from customers, uh, and then for implementing it today, it's always the kind of the daemon approach, having an intermediary do the translation. Okay, I have one more question. Um, so for pushing down uh, updates, it, I noticed that you can push down like updates to lambdas and stuff to your Greengrass core. Is there any intent to, or can you currently uh, push down just applications in general too? Or is that on the future roadmap um, for the SDK? The applications aren't part of the core. Um, so the things you can push down with Greengrass Core today, your land the functions, updated routes, um, and if that updated route includes like additional devices that are part of that route, um, those you can push down today. Um, I haven't heard a use case for applications, but maybe if you have something you want to send to me, I can give you my card and I can take okay. it and run with it. Thank you. Yeah. Hello. Hello, the, which OSs does, does the AWS IoT device SDK run on? Uh, I mean, for that one, it's generally, I've seen Linux, Windows. Um, we kind of run about 10 different languages. So 
I haven't seen an OS that hasn't run on, even real-time OSs. We have a porting guide for, for C, so is there does one it, Does it run on Windows 10 IoT? I have not tried it. I would need to check. Okay, so, so right. Uh, and, and then which OSs does the AWS Greengrass OS run on? Uh, so right now we support the Amazon Linux image. Uh, you can also get it running on Ubuntu. Uh, it's a little bit more work for Ubuntu. Uh, and then ARM as well, like Raspberry Pi. So that's what's supported today. No, okay. uh, there's no Windows support today, if you're going to ask. Yeah. Okay. And one other question. How does this play with OPC? Uh, kind of similar to the, the last point as well. Right now, the Greengrass core just has the MQTT connection to the downstream devices. If you're using like OPC UA or using Modbus or CAN bus, that protocol conversion has to happen one layer down from the Greengrass core. So then that, that conversion happens at a daemon that runs. That daemon is then responsible to act as a Greengrass device to publish to the core. Okay, thank you. The light bulb, pro the light bulb uh, project that you showed us earlier, is that available on Git? It's not. I, 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 we should. We should make it available. <laughs> it's yeah. not today. That's good feedback. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Let me make a note of that so I remember. Hey, yeah. Uh, wanted to know, are there any other AWS services that support the two-way WebSocket protocol, either now or in the near future, other than IoT, or is it, is it just IoT at this point? Uh, as far as managed service, today it's just IoT. Um, but if you're running just like IoT on AWS, a lot of customers use things like just EC2. So they'll run their own WebSockets or Nginx and do WebSockets that right. way. But managed service perspective, right. it's just AWS IoT. Okay. Is there any, I, you probably can't comment on future plans, but. Yeah. I mean, and I focus just on the IoT service okay. too, okay. mostly. So. <laughs> All right. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Great. I'll take any other questions. Uh, I'll walk in the back. <laughs>